So uh, it's about 1.30 now, and our next presentation uh, actually segues very nicely into what we were just talking about, because uh, anybody that was kind of paying attention is we were doing effectively mesh operations like planar slice to a mesh. We weren't doing it to a VSP component. So um, keep that in mind uh, while we start moving on to this other presentation, which is, you know, talking about um, using neg negative components to do trimming operations. And uh, this is kind of a, you know, it really wouldn't be a, a VSP workshop if I didn't show you guys how to do something kind of stupid and difficult. Um, but uh, we'll roll with it anyway. Uh, let me go ahead and start this. So double check that the stream is going out. Okay, well, um, in this presentation, we'll talk a bit about trimming components with negative volumes and leveraging some of that stuff that Rob was talking about on uh, on Wednesday, uh, dealing with comp geom and CFD mesh and negative trimming and the like, and show you some of the application that you can do with this. Uh, again, I'm Brandon Litherland uh, from NASA Langley in the Aeronautic Systems and NASA's branch, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this. And so as an outline of what we're going to discuss today, we're going to look at negative volume, you know, what it is, why it might be useful, how OpenVSP leverages negative volume in its various uh, operations, and talk about, uh, you know, some of the trimmed CAD export stuff like Justin talked about yesterday, and then providing some tips and guidance for things like conformal components in particular, uh, because they have their own sort of uh, behaviors and personalities when it comes to various components. And then we can talk a bit about some other guidance as well. So as an introduction to uh, negative volume and trimming components, you can see that there are a variety of ways to create uh, highly complex and in some cases detailed geometries for export or analysis or even just for fun. So in the top left here, we've got an example of that um, split flow turbofan uh, example model that I built up using prop components and uh, some wrapped stacks, and uh, I just sliced away a piece so you could get a nice internal view of that component. And in these others, uh, here on the right side, this is a uh, physical thickness watertight shell of an X57 high lift propeller spinner that includes the trimmed away region to allow the high lift blades to fold back into their recesses so that the blades can uh, be conformal. And all of this stuff here was done in OpenVSP. I didn't use CAD to support any of this. Um, you can make things that are additive and subtracted where you could build up a complex component like this ball bearing in the middle, or this radial bearing. And uh, you can do things just for fun. So if you wanted to make a plastic, um, you know, mace or something like that, you can make just, you know, kind of off the wall, just for fun geometries, because why not? And the idea here is that you can add or subtract from OpenVSP geometries, from meshes. You can do this in multiple steps. And for those of you that kind of recognize what's going on here, we're effectively approaching Boolean operations where we're doing add, subtract, and union. So the idea here is that the, the, you can use this in kind of creative ways. So negative volume uh, is, again, turned on under the general tab for all these components, and it's found... Um, here under the CFD mesh negative volume tab, you just turn the button on. And then rather than being an additive geometry where comp geom or anything else will find the intersection and then use the outer surface and add it, it turns it around and uses the inside surface instead and just flips all the normals so that it's more of a subtractive geometry. And several VSP functions use this, uh, including things like trim surfaces and CAD export, comp geom and CFD mesh, and even mass properties and things like wave drag and planar slice, as we just demonstrated uh, today and yesterday. And uh, I guess, you know, while I'm at it, this is what that VSP geometry looked like here in the top right. So these are these transparent red cutter volumes that I built outside the X57 high lift propellers as, say, envelopes for clearance. And then the result of that is the trimmed region here in these spinners. And I also hollowed it out using a conformal geometry. So this became a watertight shell. And one could 3D print this for fit checks if they wanted to. You don't have to use any other software aside from going to your printing uh, programs. And so, again, the idea here is that you can trim away material uh, from a model ahead of time 
which reduces or even eliminates steps in your refinement later. And this can go for CFD gridding, going out to CAD, or again, 3D printing. So these are three different versions of that X57 nacelle, one of which was used for CFD analysis in a study on the conformal nature of the propellers and configurations. One is CAD for structures, and the other is a functional 3D printed model where these blades are hinged. There's a geared uh, rotating connection down here at the bottom. So you can hand crank this up to speed and watch the blades deploy and get an idea of the dynamics of the system. So, you know, this stuff is actually really useful. So we'll go a little bit into some techniques that will help you in this process. And of course, let's start with Comgeon because it's one of the most reliable ways to use negative volumes and do triangulated uh, surfaces in BSP. And you, the guidance here is to, to follow the best practices that we've covered in the VS Piero talks earlier, the Comgeom stuff, the, the intersection properties, you know, avoid poorly intersected surfaces and edges. And that includes, you know, sharp angles and overlaps because you can end up with, say, infinite intersection, poorly defined edges. Um, just, you know, use best practices there. And so the resulting trimmed surface is dependent on the surface resolution of the trimming component rather than the parent. So you see two examples of this down here at the bottom. On the left, we have uh, a radial distribution of uh, a you know fake cylinder that I put together, and it's only got two cross sections. And you can see that the resulting trim has all of these little needle or sliver triangulations inside the trim. So yes, this is a watertight surface, and yes, technically it can go to an analysis, it has surface area and everything else, but it's not great. So if you give it a few more points in U and make it so that it more closely matches uh, between the two bodies, you're going to get a much better intersection, you're going to get a well-defined surface, and in general, it's going to be a better triangulation. So what we just talked about there is generally true for most functions that use triangulation rather than the Bezier curves themselves. Um, and so just keep that in mind when you're trying to do things like this. And uh, so kind of like we demonstrated in the previous talk is that CompGeom and most of these other um, mesh operations work on meshes too. So it goes for, you know, VSP generated or imported message from things like CAD or gridding or scans. So you can do these steps not only on native VSP components, but on things that you bring in or things that you create. So that if you look carefully at the general tab of a mesh geometry, you'll see that it has mass properties and it has the option for negative volume. So keep that in mind that as long as this thing is watertight, it can have a volumetric density and it has mass. And so we're getting into the, the discussion here of Boolean operations where multiple addition and subtraction steps can be performed to create unique geometries in OpenVSP. So this example over here on the right, you can see that we started with that radial distribution of cylinders. And all I did was copy it, scale it down to about 98%, shift it a little so that it was aligned to the center, use that to core out the center, and then trimmed away fore and aft using two other box components. And the result is this kind of sheet metal-esque um, component that's kind of, you know, like a turning gear. And it is watertight. You can give it a density. You can do mass properties on this. You can, you can do other stuff with these, which is really cool. I was kind of surprised when I found out how in-depth and how far down the rabbit hole you can go with some of these operations. And something interesting here is that if you find that the meshes aren't behaving well, you know, that the trimming isn't working improperly, you notice holes or gaps or the surface normals are flipped or VSB just outright crashes. You can export uh, the multi-tag surface here that you can see all of these surfaces have different color. Export it as a tri or an STL and then bring it back in as a single mesh. That will usually fix the problem because it, it lets VSP kind of reanalyze where all the stuff is supposed to be pointing. Um, so that will help you down the road. Some other things that you can do here, and because you can do this in a step-by-step -step process, you can use negative volume and export import meshes to create custom features in a VSP Aero panel run. And so this was, you know, again, kind of just a fun demonstration to see if I could pull it off. But the imported meshes and the VSP components can be merged in panel mode. 
And so the, the quasi-Boolean operations here can be used to create flow-throughs and even things like fillets and strakes. So if you find that this you know, build-up approach or this watertight mesh surface that you've built doesn't want to run in VSP or you end up with that first iteration and it goes not a number and isn't happy or can't find trailing edges or something, Try turning on that experimental file format, uh, kind of like we discussed with the best practices presentation, and you might find that it handles it okay. Um, it's just, it just seems to be more reliable. So for the Strake example, um, I gave a talk at a workshop, I think like two years ago, where I had tried to make um, the inside of a fuselage component into a Strake by, you know, doing intersections and cutting things away. And... Um, so what I did here is I used that same component and I added some physical material for it to cut away from and then I removed it. So over here on the right, you can see that what's left after doing that operation is what was intended with the fillet. So then it's up to me to try and get rid of all this other stuff and build it up on the bottom again, which can be done. You know, you can use the lower straight component that's involved in that, cut this away and clear material out. But I, I found it kind of interesting that I went through the process of trying to piece all this stuff together and then bring it over into gridding software and then do the intersections and try and cut everything away by hand. And it, it was not a simple process. But to be able to do this type of stuff in OpenVSP, particularly if you're trying to do things like panel mode, it's hinting at some additional capabilities there that I hadn't really expected which is really cool. So when we're moving on to things like CFD mesh techniques, you can of course adjust your lengths and your growth ratios to try and make sure that you have sufficient resolution of your tries. And uh, as usual, avoid poorly overlapped surfaces, very sharp edges and the like. And really when it comes down to CFD mesh, you might find that there are some gaps and that's, that's kind of okay. If you're doing this to try and export out into CFD software for whatever reason and you find that there are gaps in the tries, you can always repair that after the fact. This has done 99% of the work for you. You just need to repair some spots. So it's still good enough to go out and the intersections are still there. And you can always make the primary mesh without the trimming, say in this unstructured uh, CFD mesh, and then bring it back in and use negative volume to cut away afterward. And it should still work. So um, let's move on a bit to some of the things that go on in, say, the analyses in OpenVSP. And I always like to use these kind of nested spheres demonstration to show what's going on. So negative volume removes material in the mass property analysis because effectively it's just doing a series of planar slice. And so we have two examples here. One of example A where... It's kind of the old way of setting uh, something to be hollow. You set an internal volume density to zero, and then you raise the priority so that OpenVSP knows that it's supposed to calculate that and then use whatever's around it as what's left. So once you do that, you can get the mass to come out correct, but the problem is it still thinks that it has volume. So in your mass properties, it's not cutting away anything. So if you look at... Um, the thickness here of about 0.1 length units, uh, the mass comes out for both of these examples as 1.122. The volume of the first one is 4.16, and the volume in B is 1.122, like it's supposed to be. Because in the second one, negative volume doesn't need a priority or a density. It knows that it's not supposed to be there. So it just cores it out completely. So you get the right volume and the right mass, which is pretty handy. When we're talking about things like CAD export, you know, Justin dove into this a little bit with the trimmed CAD example and showed that you can do negative volume and core things out. And the idea here is that you can, um, you can get away with this. And the idea, particularly with trimmed export and trimmed CAD and negative volumes, is as long as what you are trying to export is a quality Bezier surface that's not going to cause problems, then it will come in as a watertight solid surface in CAD. So part of the issue of why you may want to do this as opposed to trying to do some of these operations in CAD or to do things where you're, say, slicing cross sections of an exported geometry and then trying to loft that yourself 
is that CAD lofting methods and open VSPs, more fine controls in some cases using strengths and angles, can differ quite a lot. So let's say, for example, that you have a, um, a geometry where you have a few cross sections and you're trying to loft all those together, but your options are either normal or tangential if you're trying to do a simplified blend, or you do a boundary blend using 3D curves to try and make everything go through. And yes, you know, you have a lot of detailed control in CAD to make this exactly the way that it's supposed to be. But if you're in a hurry or you don't really care about those exact details, you just want something representative, or even worse, if you're trying to match something that exists somewhere else, that can be problematic. You can end up with ringing in the spline, you can end up with weird little uh, overtight curvatures, and there can be problems. And in fact, the lofting can often fail if sections with a different number of control points or regions, like I said, with very tight curvature are present. And so the idea here is that you would rather just export the true intended surface from OpenVSP and then modify things as needed. So if you wanted this example here, where it's just a pod and a bunch of cylinders, cut everything away, and then say you wanted to round some corners in CAD to make it, you know, not sharp. Let's say that this was a, uh, a scribe or something where you wanted to be able to break off these individual little points at certain distances. Well, that's all well and good. You can finish that up in about five seconds in CAD. But the point here is that as long as you make sure that each component is capable of exporting cleanly, then, you know, you're, you're going to have a good import coming into CAD. So quality part definitions in OpenVSP make intersection and trimming much easier in CAD. And so one example of this is the uh, X57 folding blade hinge. And so what you might find is that if you export this geometry, say as a surface or even as a watertight solid, and you try and recreate it in CAD using slicing and then using say lofted surfaces without going through the process of making sure that the leading edge is correct, the tailing edge is correct, the top and bottom surfaces, the thicknesses are exactly right. That blend will oscillate up and down in between these cross sections and to your eye it might look fine but if you actually get down into the details and measure it, it's different. And that stuff matters to structures, it matters to mass, it matters to your dynamics, it matters to your aerodynamics, all of that stuff does come into play. And so when you bring in the clean, smooth design from OpenVSP that doesn't have any of those features, and then say you want the reference location for, in this case, the folding hinge, you can bring that in along with the geometry that's already watertight. You've got a good, clean solid of the blade as it's intended, and then you can just modify the hinge mechanism for fabrication in CAD. So you can just add the features to a good surface without having to try and build the whole thing up from scratch and then eventually cause problems. And with that, we'll step in a little bit to uh, some tips for conformal components. So uh, quite often we'll see that if somebody wants to use negative volume um, for a conformal component, you're trying to make a shell, you're trying to hollow something out, you might even be trying to you know, make a void space for a fuel tank, you know, for whatever reason your application it's a nice idea to try and match up the resolution in U and W between the conformal and the parent. So in one case here, you see in the top right, we've got uh, a pod that has very low resolution and the conformal has, say, numW of like 41 or 21 or something like that. So you can see that it's very smooth. If you core that away, again, the trim surface is going to be based on the trimming component. So you're going to be highly faceted on the outside and then smooth on the inside. To have something that's more akin to a constant thickness shell, you want to try and match those up. And something that you uh, may want to pay attention to is that something with excessively thin walls might have issues trimming uh, for larger length units, like say feet or meters. If you're trying to get something that is a millimeter thick or even half a millimeter thick in some cases when you're trying to make something representative, say sheet metal, um, you might end up with some problems because the intersections particularly if your surface and cutting resolutions aren't matched. You'll have one that pokes in and out of one another. Your intersections are not going to be well-defined and you're going to end up with gaps. So be really careful when you're doing that. Or just scale into a different length unit is probably the better way to do it. Um, and uh, something interesting here is that the conformal uh, numU numW is only specified in one location. So it applies to each section 
of the child geometry, and that includes things like caps. So here in the bottom right, you can see that we have a conformal on a wing, and while the top surface has a numu of 21, just like the parent wing, you can see that the caps also have a numu of 21. If for whatever reason it is important to you that those grid spacings are relatively equivalent, just beware that that can happen, and you're probably going to go have, have to go back and derez some of those sections uh, later on down the line. Some more uh, behaviors of conformal components to watch out for, and this is mostly just, you know, grid quality type stuff. It's not that this won't work, just pay attention to it. And that's that wing conformals can be a little bit troublesome when it comes to meshing, especially if you're doing things like UV or cord trimming. And uh, it can cause the panels to kind of group and try and wrap around these edges. Now, it's still doing a great job. The conformal geometry, at least as far as the outer mold line goes, is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. But if you're doing this and you care about the underlying mesh on, say, the inside of this component, you know, if you've got, say, CFD and you're trying to do sloshing or some crazy thing like that, um, you're going to have to deal with this and just know that that, that exists. But something else to, that's kind of cool about conformals is they are a component that can be repositioned in the transform tab. So you can move their location, their rotation, and even their scale. And conformal components do not have to be aligned with the parent at all. In fact, if you make a conformal with a displacement of zero, you basically just made a clone of it. And you can offset it and put it somewhere else in space, and it's always going to track the outer mold line of the parent. Um, which is kind of a you know neat little goofy way to use it. But uh, in one of the recent uh, releases, a uh, few, I think it was still around last year actually, uh, conformal offset can be negative. And rather than creating something that fits inside the component, it creates an envelope around the parent instead. So in this view, we've taken this pod, set a negative uh, conformal offset to something like, say, 0 0.1 feet. And what it's done is it's just kind of wrapped all the way around the outside. So if you wanted to have something that was a negative component to clear material away around some body and then mesh it, get rid of the pieces, and then add that other component back in, you can do that. That's perfectly fine. And something about conformal components that you really should watch out for is be careful using conformal with things that are really complex like propellers. There's a lot going on under the hood with that component. It is probably the most complex VSB component that there is right now. And when you try and put a conformal inside that thing, it's going to behave kind of like with the wing, but it's, it, you're going to end up with some issues because it's trying to oscillate between the blade curves and make things match. And it's, you're probably better off just building a new propeller with the, the parameters uh, that you want. So just be really careful with that. Um, looks like I have about, oh, seven minutes or so until the end of this presentation. So, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about other guidance in this process. Uh, don't try and do everything at once, uh, please. You'll have much more success by trimming things away step by step or doing things one at a time. So subtract a little bit, add back what's important, trim a little bit more and do these things step by step. So in some cases, you can have the negative component clear everything out and leave the pieces that you want, sure. But it's probably better to do things step by step, you know, just like with VSP or just like with everything else. Excuse me. Um, build up complexity as you go. If you notice that your trimmed CAD is having some issues going into whatever software you have, um, try to determine what surface is causing the failure. And you can usually identify that by looking at it in a wireframe format. Most CAD packages will identify gaps and broken edges and poor quality um, B-Rep solids that come in and, and give you an idea of where the issue uh, is. If that doesn't work, go, you know, just like with VSP Arrow and everything else, remove everything except what you know should come out nice and clean, export it, verify that it's good, and then add something else, and then slowly build the process back up and try and identify what caused the failure. And so we've got about five minutes here. Uh, I probably have some time for some Q&A, and, uh, you know, while we're doing some Q&A, I might, you know, open a couple of these files just to show you what they look like in 3D, but... Uh, you know, I don't think I'll have time to go through the process itself because it can be a, a bit tedious. But um, I appreciate everybody's time and, and hope that, uh, you know, you at least got something interesting out of it.
So Brandon, we had two questions that just came up. One was um, any suggestion on how you'd use this feature to cut out a wing, cut out a volume for a control surface or a flap for a wing that has a more complex geometry, any past experience? And then also, is it okay to make span-wise morphing wing? I think he means a blended wing with conformal components and what's the best practice for it? Um, to, uh, to both of those, um, it, you know, we, uh, I'll tell you what, let, let me uh, see let what me I can do here first. Um, so here we go. Let's start with this one. Hopefully it'll it'll bring in. So the answer to the first question is yes, you can absolutely use this feature to trim out components for something like a flap. And let me um, go ahead and select all here in shade and we'll get an idea of what that looks like. And um, actually perhaps a hidden view is more appropriate for this. Um, but what I've done here is I've taken the clean X57 uh, wing that's, you know, two sections, constant tape ratio, etc. I used a kind of a diagonal outer mold line envelope cutter on the flap and cleared that material away. And then uh, what I did here is, you know, you can come into the motion tab and change that from deployed to nested. And yes, you can clear material away uh, from this uh, and, you know, pre-set it up as ready to go for higher order CFD. Um, absolutely. Uh, what I will say is, unless you have done this very cleverly, panel mode is going to have kittens with this um, because you have, uh, you know, vertical surfaces right here. There's, if you're not very careful, it can refuse to acknowledge that this is actually an edge and it will treat it like a blunt face. You can see you've got these really tiny points back here that probably aren't the best quality anyway. Um, so I will say use with caution. Um, I'm still developing some best practices on how to accomplish this, but it can be done. And particularly if you're trying to set something like this up for say RAND CFD or you know something a bit higher order than a uh, potential code, you can totally do that, yes. Um, and uh, let's see, is it okay to make span-wise uh, morphing wing with conformal components? So for the morphing wing and the conformal components, uh, I'm trying to, to make sure that I understand exactly what's being asked here. So with with a conformal component... Brandon, I'll the, demo that one in the next one when I demo blended wing. Oh, okay, yes, because you've got your advanced uh, wing demo. All right, well, yeah, that takes a little bit of the practice. Rob anyway so um, appreciate that Rob but um, so yeah there there are a variety of applications here for using negative volume uh, within your meshes so um, you can certainly envision doing something like this for the simple case of uh, a nested flap um, clearing out a region for ailerons um, is much easier um, especially if you don't really care about these things nesting you can just take a box or something and cut that region out and then um, let me just select all and show, and we'll show you what we're actually dealing with here under the hood. And uh, no show this mesh. Oh, where's that other mesh? Um, there's that cutter that I used. So we'll no show that as well. Um, here we go, and we'll no show that. So for Pete's sake, let me uh, pick there. No show that. And that, that's the clean wing. Anyway, um, so the X57 detailed model has these, um, you know, regions cut out uh, in the airfoil files themselves. So uh, Jeff Beacon from NASA Langley here uh, in my branch as well, made all the custom airfoil files that have the flat cove built into them. And, uh, you know, that's great for building up an outer mold line and for implementing these things in a physical sense, but you have to be really careful when you're doing stuff like this. So, um, yeah, there are a few ways to try and accomplish that. One of them is just trimming it away and then building up your grids and exporting out. Another one, of course, is directly modifying the airfoil files themselves, but you end up with these issues, right? You come back to the airfoil point and it needs to take a hard bend Hopefully that is well defined, but you can you, you can have problems with that. So um, there are a number of ways to try and accomplish this. Um, but anyway, so uh, that brings us to two o'clock.
and uh, uh, I, I will try and answer any other questions over here in the uh, chat after I drop offline and let Rob go ahead and get started. Um, but uh, I appreciate the time to demonstrate this stuff. I know, you know, I feel like I've got a reputation to keep that if I don't break something in OpenVSP, I'm not working hard enough. Um, but uh, Rob, I'll go ahead and minimize all my stuff over here, and you are welcome to go ahead and share your screen. We'll make sure that everything's set up properly. Sounds great, Brandon. Um, you're, you're filling the role that Bill Fredericks originally carried, I think, well. And, you know, if you're an old Letterman fan, I think we could call those stupid VSP tricks. <laughs> Sounds like a winner to me.